to our viewing and listening audience this morning. My name is Herb Hilder, and I'm delighted, along with my wife Catherine, to be here and to lead worship for you this morning. The uh, reminder that uh, our service for this week and next week will be online only, and after next week's service, the session will review our local cases um, to determine if we return to our carefully distanced in-person worship. And the date for our annual meeting this year has been set for Sunday, February the 13th. And I'm reminded that if you have any submissions for the annual report, you are asked to have them to Ruth by next Sunday, January the 16th. This will allow Ruth two weeks to prepare the annual report and the elders a week to deliver them so that you can have them in your hands one week ahead of the meeting. Always important to have stuff beforehand. And also, if you wish to have for your annual report to be emailed to you as a PDF file, please contact Deb Ray or another of the elders. Uh, this will save paper and delivery. And that's a thank you to those who prepare annual reports. Help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let us worship him. The opening hymn is number 78. This is the day. unto you, O God Most High. Lord, as we bow before you with humble hearts, we offer our prayers to you. What in this world can compare with you, O Lord? And where else can we find such wisdom and power? And who else shows us such love and compassion and such mercy? To whom can we go for understanding and forgiveness? There is no one else, Lord, you alone are God, and in you do we trust. And so, Lord, we lift your name high and worship you with body, soul, and spirit. May all glory and majesty be given to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, blessed Trinity, now and forever. O merciful God, we confess even though you have given us everything we need and your promises are more than sufficient, we have not lived as we should. You 
You are always there to guide us, and yet too often we do not ask for it. And even when we know what we should do, we turn away and do something else. We make mistakes. We are rebellious. We are selfish and arrogant. And at times we feel too small and insignificant, and so we pity ourselves. We feel too big and arrogant, and so we puff ourselves up with pride. Lord, forgive our sinfulness. Forgive us when we do what we know we should not do, or when we do or neglect things that we know we should do. Forgive us when we confuse right and wrong and lead others astray by our confusion. And forgive us for putting conditions on love and forgiveness when you've already given us the capacity for and the examples of perfect love and forgiveness. Grant us the grace of true repentance so that we may not only confess our sins but also lament and forsake them with our whole hearts, and then bear the fruit of righteousness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And here at Knox Walkerton, they have a unique way of passing the peace <laughs> where in terms of physical distance, we honor that, but we also do action. So, we on? Yes. Peace before For us. Peace behind us, peace under our feet, peace within us, peace over us. Let all around us be peace. And the peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you.
morning, young families, parents and children together. My name is Reverend Catherine, and I'm glad to be with you this morning. And this morning, the theme is about ministry. And the text says, we have this ministry. Well, oftentimes, you folks all know what we do as ministers. We are called ministers of word and sacrament, and our special job is to baptize the babies, to share communion. Sometimes these days, it isn't quite sharing. We do it here, and you do it at home. But in the best of times, we do it all together in one place. And our other job is to teach the scripture and to preach about it. Preaching is really a kind of encouraging people to think about scripture they already know. But there are other kinds of ministry too, and we all have a ministry. This morning we have people here whose special gift for ministry is music. It's not very easy to worship without being able to have music. And then we have the people who are recording what's going on here this morning, and their ministry is about showing us worship. And that's really important too, to be able to see the things that um, God is doing in the world. And the people who do all these technical things help us to see. And those of you who are, who are watching are seeing pictures uh, on your screens. And pictures are really important. They help bring us together. They help us to know uh, the glorious things that God has made in his world. And <clears throat> that's a ministry too. And then there is a ministry that all of us have to do no matter what our special gifts are. And that ministry is loving one another. Loving one another isn't always easy. There are lots of times in our families where we disagree and we get grumpy and we fight. There are times when that happens out in the big wide world too. There are times when we are really selfish and that is not being a good minister. Right now in this time of COVID, we've had to do a lot of things that we don't really like to do. I don't like wearing a mask and I don't like being at home a lot all the time. And I know because I've talked to some uh, people at school recently, including my daughter, it's not fun to have school at home on the computer all the time. But these are things we do because we love other people. We especially do it because we love the people who could get sick easily. So we ask God to help us with our various ministries. And he promises by his spirit that he will help us with these things. If we ask and we pay attention, he will help us to lead worship, to lead singing, to produce the pictures that help us to think about God, and he will help us to love one another too. Let's pray. Our God, you give us a ministry, all of us. You give us special gifts, to use for others, and you give us a universal ministry, that is, to love one another, to think about the needs of others before our own needs. Help us to do these things th this week and be cheerful about it. Amen. The responsive reading is from Psalm 133, 133. 
how good and pleasant it is. It's like the precious oil on the head. Running down over the collar of his robes. Which falls on the mountains of Zion. which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. Amen. And the scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 to 18. 2 Corinthians 4, beginning to read at verse 1. And so, since God in his mercy has given us this wonderful ministry, we never give up. We reject all shameful and underhanded methods. We do not try to trick anyone, and we do not distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God, and all who are honest know that. If the good news we preached is veiled from anyone, it is a sign that they are perishing. Satan, the god of this evil world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe so that they are unable to see the glorious light of the good news that is shining upon them. They don't understand the message we preach about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. We don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach Christ Jesus the Lord. All we say about ourselves is that we are your servants because of what Jesus has done for us. For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made us understand that this light is the brightness of the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. But this precious treasure, this light and power that now shine within us, is held in perishable containers, that is, in our weak bodies. So everyone can see that our glorious power is from God and it's not our own. We are pressed on every side by trouble, but we are not crushed and broken. We are perplexed, but we don't give up and quit. We are hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again and keep giving. Through suffering, these bodies of ours constantly share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus, so that the life of Jesus will be glorious and obvious in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but it has resulted in eternal life for you. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, and so I speak. We know that the same God who raised our Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself along with you. All of these things are for your benefit. And as God's grace brings more and more people to Christ, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day, for our present troubles are quite small, and they won't last long. Yet they produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see right now, rather, We look forward to what we have not yet seen, 
for the troubles we see will soon be over, but the joy will last forever. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word. Him, brother, sister, let me serve you. Consortium um, for their music this morning. Just lovely to be in here. You know, online worship, uh, people have told us, ministers have told us, it's like preaching to an empty room and you're never sure whether the message and the things are really going on until something goes wrong. And um, so thank you very much for the music and to the technicians. I'm so glad people know more than I because I am truly a bear of little brain in terms of, of technology. And thank you also to the intermoderator and the session of Knox Walkerton for uh, so warmly inviting us this morning. Um, for those of you who are watching in the area, you know it's been a miserable few days of weather and uh, we're glad to be here. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. May your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and your greater glory our supreme concern. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now it's no secret to any of us watching this morning that these are interesting times in which we live. We're in the midst of the worst pandemic in a century, Hopes for an easy solution to the virus and a quick turnaround have been countered again and again. The operative word today in so many areas, certainly ministry, is pivot. The pandemic has brought certainly more problems than just sickness. Major disruption in supply chains has resulted in delivery goods delay. Hospitals and 
care homes and medical facilities are stretched beyond breaking. And many of us, as Catherine mentioned, chafe or grumble about mask wearing or social distancing. And I wonder how many of you have silently or not so silently uttered and felt from deep within your soul a lament from the Psalms. How long, O Lord? The institutional church, whether it be Presbyterian or others, have felt socialization, social isolation rather from community with other believers. I mean, so much has changed in the church since 2020 when the protocol rules came into effect. Suddenly that which we had taken for granted, Sunday by Sunday worship, special events within a community of faith, celebrations of life like baptisms and weddings and you know services to witness the resurrection have been canceled or delayed or downsized regular hospital or care home visitations would be possible unless of course we had a cold or were feeling unwell but that's all gone or dramatically altered the calling to congregational ministry never light or what some would think is sheltered work, got a lot harder and a lot more complicated. Ministers and church leaders try hard to find ways to keep their communities of faith together and in touch with one another. That remains a challenge. Online worship, of course, as you well know, provides its own challenges. You know, to find the people to record the services and then blend them as its moments, and as I said to one of the technicians this morning, none of us as ministers were trained to be TV evangelists. <laughs> now, none of this is unknown to any of us. COVID-19 has changed our lives, each of our lives, in very profound ways. And this morning, I want to concentrate and consider very encouraging a very hope-filled passage of scripture. Both of them, the Psalm 133 and the letter from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, they're realistic passages. They don't ignore the real world. They point though to a central fact that has burned particularly bright for me in these months of COVID that involved for me stepping down from full-time ministry after 39 years moving across the country from British Columbia to Ontario to be closer to family. And that central fact, the only constant we have in this life are the promises of God. That's the only constant. They do not change. How does the Welsh hymn couplet run from immortal, invisible, God only wise? We blossom and flourish like leaves on the tree, then wither and perish, but not changeth thee. The reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians is particularly pertinent, I think, in this time of COVID that has gone on far too long, and who knows how much longer. The reading is a favorite text of mine because it reminds me not only again of the importance of faith, of the faith community, but how this faith community is sustained and grows. Remember, the Corinthians Paul writes to were anything but a perfect congregation, if such a group ever exists. In Corinth, there were issues aplenty in the congregation. And Paul isn't backward about being forward in addressing these issues. You know, to do basic corrective discipline and love for this people of God. He takes on many things in these Corinthian letters that either are or will splinter the community of faith in Corinth. Here in the opening verses of the fourth chapter, Paul clearly sets before the Corinthians and us some basic reminders of living together as a community of faith. In other words, correctives against ba behaving badly. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we 
do not lose heart. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We are engaged in this ministry. First person plural, we, inclusive. Not some are engaged, or those people are engaged, or I am engaged. No, we, all of us, are engaged. We are in this ministry, in this work of reflecting the love of Jesus, of putting into daily practice the gifts of the Holy Spirit, of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness gentleness and self-control to all people, not just the ones we like or with whom we share a common interest. Because I firmly believe, based on both observation and scripture study and personal experience, that if any of us forget that, the person sitting next to us in any service of worship, maybe the person sitting next to you on a couch or in a chair, or any community of faith, if we forget that that person is our brother and sister in Christ, the community, we suffer. Look, as hard as it is to believe and realize, Jesus died on the cross and rose again as much for him or her or for all of us or the person you're having issues with as much as he died for each of us, for you and me. If we forget or soft pedal that, the community of faith, the group, will wither in spiritual energy. Over the years, I've known and served in congregations that seemed to be united in only one thing, and that was spite. And as far as I know, spite is not a fruit or a gift of the Spirit. Now hear me, there is nothing wrong with constructive criticism because none of us is perfect. We might always be, and we should be always learning and growing, but being engaged in this ministry must not be dominated by carping, demeaning, murmuring. That behavior is destructive. Remember what happened to the Israelites on their way to the promised land when they became incessant and negative murmurers? We do not lose heart, continues Paul. How realistic is that? Now he recognizes that sometimes even the most faithful, the most determined to love the Lord can be discouraged. Heavy laden to the point of giving up or giving in to the temptation to say, oh, what's the use? Why bother? What's the point? You know, to disbelieve that God is in control and that we are in his hands. Now, maybe losing heart is not something with which you really struggle. You're always one of those glass is always half full people. You just know that even if there's a pile of manure in the yard, there's got to be a pony somewhere. Praise the Lord, because I rejoice for you. However, let me give you a few things to think about that may tempt anyone to lose heart. And I'm not going to belabor the COVID realities and protocols, but maybe you're caring for an aging parent or a spouse or a relation, and you wonder if you can meet all the demands, maintain balance, without being consumed by time and energy, such care demands. Maybe you're in a work that no longer brings the sparkle to your life that it once did. Maybe you're not in any work at all. Maybe you're in a loveless marriage or relationship. Maybe you're wondering whether anyone will be interested in coming as your next minister to Knox Walkerton. Searches for, next, for new ministers take longer than they once did. And then you enter COVID into that equation. And if I can add just a personal note of encouragement to you, 
as a congregation searching. Try not to be discouraged. Be discerning in prayer because God is preparing the heart of a person to come here to be your new minister. And I firmly believe that. And in these wearing and trying situations, it can be very tempting to lose heart. How then does Paul have the nerve to tell suffering people, do not lose heart? How can he say that? He tells us, since it is by God's mercy. That's the first verse. For it is God who said, let light shine out of darkness who has shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I think Paul is speaking about nothing less than God's grace because this is part of God's mercy. Grace. It's what shines in the world's darkness. It's the treasure Paul refers to that he speaks about in the seventh verse. Grace is what enables each of us, all of us, to persevere because grace gives us perspective. Grace reminds us that in the end, it isn't all about us, it's about God. Grace reminds us that we didn't choose God, but he chose us first. You know, grace, that free and unmerited favor of God, working powerfully on the mind and the heart to change people's lives. Because it is such mercy and such grace that enables each of us to live daily the life that Paul knew God wanted the Corinthians to live and that Paul challenges each of us to live. St. Paul knew that the Christ to live a Christ-centered life would be anything but easy and straightforward. Here again of that description of life as it sometimes is. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Why? God's mercy and God's grace. Now that's not to lightly dismiss tragedy or debilitating illness or life-threatening illnesses or the unexpected, the unwarranted, the unnecessary and the unwelcome in this life. It is though to remind us that the nasty does not have the last word in this life. You know, God holds the torn pieces of our lives in his hands. We haven't been left to twist on the wind or to dry up on the vine or to wither in the heat of the sun or whatever expression you want to use. God's mercy, God's grace is the last word. You know, consider f just for a few moments the times in your life when things you dreaded never came to pass, the times when you believed you would never make it until the next day, but that looking back, you saw that God really is the God of the most impossible situation. The times when prayers were answered, often in ways better than you could ever expect or anticipate. These then, I think, are basic good reminders from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And while there are truly real reasons to cause us to be discouraged, to lose heart, Paul calls, challenges us really, to remember that we are not in this call to follow Jesus all by ourselves. We have this ministry. And we have the unalterable and strong promises of God's mercy. Pretty encouraging truths for each of us? I think so. Amen. During COVID, in the time when we're doing online services and even before in person, the passing of offering plates just is not done. But that doesn't mean the expenses and the commitments and the responsibilities and the wider work of a congregation don't go on. 
So uh, there are ways you can, got to get this right, uh, e-transfers to Knox Treasure at uh, whiteman.ca or mail to the church, and it's box 1632-208 Cayley Street, Walkerton, Ontario, N0G2V0. So we join in singing the doxology for all those offerings that are coming here. Father, out of your generosity, we give you thanks for the ways in which we can return a portion of that which has been given to us to further your kingdom. Bless the offerings that are given. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Let us pray. From the rising of the sun to its setting, let us pray to the Father. Father God, we bring before you your worldwide church, all denominations from all places, and we pray for unity and healing. We pray that divisions may be healed and that where there are difficulties, we can learn to disagree well. We pray for a time when we may be able to speak your name boldly without fear. Healing God, we bring before you all who are sick and suffering. We pray especially for all those who are struggling owing to the ongoing global pandemic. We pray that you would give wisdom to those in power to make the decisions that will be for the good of all and to help your people discern how best to keep each other safe while striking a balance to enable lives to be lived to. We pray for those who are waiting for hospital treatment or for the results of tests. Give peace in the midst of the storm. And Lord, we bring before you all who are, for whom we have been praying for in this congregation or for those known personally to us. Lord of light, we pray for those who do not yet know you. And we ask that you would use us to shine brightly so that your glory may be known in all places. And we pray for this community, for this congregation. We pray that the search for a new minister might continue and make good progress, and that the person of your choosing might be revealed to the search committee and to the congregation. Heavenly Father, we bring before you those people who have been able, unable to travel to see family and loved ones for such a long time. So many moments missed and we know that brings hurt and anger and upset and grief. We pray for those who travel and those who put the arrangements in place to ensure safety and well-being. 
Father of comfort and hope, we remember those who have died recently or who may have anniversaries around this time. We especially thank you for the life and ministry of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. May he rest in peace and rise in glory. And Lord, we lift to you those who are grieving or preparing for the loss of someone they love. We ask for you to bless the tears that fall and bring healing, comfort, and peace in those difficult times. And in a moment of silence, we pray for a person, a situation, or a place that is laying heavily in our hearts. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, as we pray together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The hymn is, Will You Come and Follow Me? Will you come and follow me? Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you, both now, henceforth, and forevermore.